Hello, hello, hello. A quick show of hands, who's heard the word Dagster before? Sweet. Um, all right, let's get started. My name is Sandy. I'm the tech lead for the Dagster project. I'm here to talk to you about orchestrating software-defined assets. Uh, does that work? There we go. Um, OK, some quick background on myself. If you heard of me talk at a data science conf or any data conference before, it was probably in my Cloudera days when I was contributing to Hadoop and Spark, and I co-wrote this book about data science. I spent the middle chunk of my career as a practicing data scientist, building uh, pipelines and machine learning models at a couple different companies. And that was a fun time, but also a pretty frustrating time, because I found there were big gaps in the tooling that I needed to do my job. So a couple years ago, I came back to the world of tooling uh, and tried to fill what I saw as the biggest gap, and I joined Elemental to work on Dagster. Before we get to that gap, and before we get to Dagster, I'd like to step away entirely from the world of data and talk to you about front-end engineering and uh, cluster orchestration and DevOps. These domains have something in common, which is that they've all gone through a big transition in the last decade or two. So we used to build websites using jQuery, but now we use React. We used to orchestrate our compute clusters using Yarn, but now we use Kubernetes. We used to provision infrastructure using high-powered shell scripts, but now we use Terraform. And so technology transitions happen all the time. What's interesting here is that all these transitions have something in common, and it's that they move from an imperative paradigm to a declarative paradigm. For those of you who aren't familiar with these terms, here are some crude definitions. Under an imperative paradigm, you give commands telling your system what to do. Change this, change that. With a declarative paradigm, you instead describe the end state that you want your system to be in, and then let a control plane manage that change. So what's going on here? Why do we see this pattern of transition? If you take a closer look at the history of any of these software domains, you start to get a sense for it. So the initial challenge is about speed to build stuff. It takes developers a long time to get basic things done, like provision an EC2 server or change what shows up in a text box. Tools then come along that speed this up dramatically. So jQuery, for example, makes it stupidly easy to change what shows up in a text box. By making it so easy to build stuff, uh, these tools solve the initial problem, but they create another one, which is that now people build a ton of stuff. It becomes difficult to reason about all this stuff. What text boxes are expected to appear on this page? What text are they expected to contain? And so finally, a new breed of tools arrive that tackle this problem, and these tools are built declaratively instead of imperatively. That's because declarative tools are highly effective at taming complexity. They do this in a couple of main ways. First, they ask users to explicitly state their intentions and expectations, which means you get an unambiguous plan that's inspectable by anyone. Second, they offer a principled way of managing change. Instead of an unstructured log of things you did, you can ask the system, why did you make this change? Why did you put this value inside this text box? And the system can give you a clear and useful answer. So now, let's talk about a domain with complexity and change up the wazoo, and that domain is data. In the world of data, where are we on this tooling journey? Well, it used to be really hard to build stuff. So 10 years ago, if you wanted to calculate some statistic over every event from your website, you needed to set up a compute cluster with 20 different services, and then even the simplest operations could take tens of minutes to complete. Since then, we've built powerful databases and data processing engines to make this all effortless. So now with Snowflake or Spark, you can write three lines of code and get a result in a couple seconds. And we've built workflow managers that make it easy to chain a bunch of data processing steps together. So building data pipelines has never been easier. The result of this is that we build tons of data pipelines. At even medium-sized organizations, it's not uncommon to have hundreds of tables, machine learning models, and data sets, and tens of thousands of lines of code that are responsible for generating them. This code will span different compute frameworks and storage systems. So some will happen in a data warehouse, 
some in Spark, Snowflake, Pandas, TensorFlow. Here's a little example from my past life working with health insurance data. Uh, we wanted to answer a simple question of how many people were admitted to the hospital during this time period. And we ended up with this chain of seven intermediate data sets that spanned three compute frameworks. So there's a lot that's great about this picture. Maintaining intermediate data sets lets us reuse valuable data cleaning work when we need to build another uh, application. And supporting multiple ways of processing data gives us flexibility to use the right tool for the job. But without extremely careful shepherding, this complexity naturally devolves into chaos. We end up with multiple versions of the same data sets created by different people or by the same people at different times. It's hard to distinguish trustworthy maintained data from one-off artifacts that went stale months ago. Discovering how a table or machine learning model is generated requires a heroic act of code spelunking. And debugging requires untangling a complicated history of state mutations. This chaos interferes with our ability to accomplish our goals. So we can't trust our data because we don't know how it's generated or how it's expected to be kept up to date. And we spend most of our energy wading through our existing system so we don't have the mental space to expand it. Which is all to say that I think we're solidly in this upper right box. Managing all the data and pipelines is still really hard. What would it take to bring a declarative approach to data management and tame this chaos? So a declarative approach revolves fundamentally around a declarative entity. In front-end engineering, the entity is a UI component. So you declare the UI components that you want to exist and how you want those components to be rendered. In DevOps, it's a resource. So you declare the servers or other infrastructure components that you want to exist and what you want their properties to be. What's the declarative entity in data? It's the asset. So an asset is a database table, a machine learning model, a report, any object produced by your data platform that captures some understanding of the world. It could be a source asset that's ingest ingested directly from some external system, or it could be a derived asset that's built from source assets or other derived assets. Creating and maintaining data assets is the main reason that people build data pipelines in the first place. Assets function as the interfaces between different teams. They're the objects that we inspect when we want to debug problems, and ultimately, they're the products that data teams build for the rest of the world. Managing assets declaratively means defining them in software. It means writing code to specify the set of assets that you expect to exist and how you expect those assets to relate to each other. An orchestrator then becomes responsible for keeping the contents of physical storage aligned with those software definitions. Um, we use the word materialization to refer to the physical manifestation of an asset. The table in a database or file in a file system where the physical contents are stored. So if all of this sounds a little abstract, that's okay. I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk making this concrete and walking through some of the implications. And I'm going to do that through the lens of Dagster. For those of you who aren't familiar, Dagster is an open source orchestration platform. We recently introduced software-defined assets as a core element of Dagster's data model. With this new abstraction, Dagster becomes a critical tool not just for running workflows, but also for organizing, managing, and evolving data. So back to software-defined assets. A software-defined asset specifies an asset that you intend to exist and how to compute that asset's contents. Assets don't come out of nowhere. They're produced by computations, which in Dagster we call ops. So to get a table in your data warehouse, you have to run some code that puts it there. And those computations normally operate on other assets. So the code um, that puts your table there will read other, uh, other tables to figure out what should be inside your table. A software-defined asset is basically the combination of these three things. So it has an asset key, which identifies the asset that it corresponds to. For example, it could be the name of a table in a database. It has an op, which is the function that can be run to produce the asset. And it has upstream asset keys, which reference assets that our op will read from to compute our asset. The upstream asset keys usually correspond to the asset keys of other software-defined assets, which means that a group of software-defined assets naturally forms a graph. 
So here's a software-defined asset that's built using Dagster's Python API. I'll walk you through it. The name of the decorated function defines the asset key. So in this case, the asset represents a forecast of activity on our website, and it'll be stored in a table that's called activity forecast. The implementation of the decorated function is the op. In this case, it uses pandas, but ops can use any compute framework. And an asset doesn't even need to be tabular data. So it could be a machine learning model or a set of images. The arguments to this function designate the upstream assets that this asset is based on. In this case, it's an asset called activity daily stats, which holds historical data on websites, uh, our website's activity that we're gonna build the forecast from. Something you might notice here is that I'm not showing any code that actually reads uh, or writes to or from physical storage. The op is a pure function. To support this functional style of programming, Dagster allows the code that writes the asset to storage to be provided separately and shared across multiple assets. You don't have to do things this way, but if you do, it makes your assets a lot more testable. Decorating a Python function isn't the only way to build a software-defined asset. So if you wanted to find an as uh, asset using SQL, you could use dbt for this. And a dbt model actually fits all of the criteria that we talked about for a software-defined asset. Uh, let's walk through one. Uh, <clears throat> so this activity daily stats asset has the same core components as the Python asset. The name of the file, which determines the name of the dbt model, and thus the name of the table in physical storage, is the name of the asset. The select statement is the op. It's what we run to compute the contents of the asset. It's a description of a computation. And then the refs are upstream asset keys. They point to other tables um, that this computation accesses. Dagster can actually model dependencies between assets defined in Python and assets that are defined in dbt. It does this by offering a Python utility that makes it easy to load all the models in a dbt project as software-defined assets. So once you define a set of assets in code, either directly in Python or by loading from dbt or some other external tool, you can start to work with them in a, a web interface and start to operate them. Um, <clears throat> uh, the code down here is how you tell Dagster to scan a Python package and make all of the assets inside of it loadable from the UI. Uh, and here's that web UI. So we have a visual representation of all the assets that we were just looking at in code. Uh, by the way, everything that I'm showing you uh, and about to show you is open source. So you can get to this view by installing a Python package with pip and then running a single command. At the bottom, we've got our activity forecast asset, which is the one that we defined in Python. Right above it, we've got our activity daily stats asset, which is the one that we defined using dbt. And above that, we got a couple other assets which came from other models inside our dbt project. If you've worked with tools that show DAGs, like Airflow, this might look a little bit familiar, but there are a couple key differences that I, I wanna point out off the bat. So the first one is that each node represents an asset, not a task or op. In fact, multiple assets can actually be generated by the same op. These three dbt assets are generated by the same uh, single run dbt project op, which invokes the dbt command line interface. The second is that there's no central DAG artifact that holds the dependency structure. Each asset on its own knows about the upstream assets that it depends on. This makes it scalable to huge numbers of assets. You don't need some central team to maintain a code artifact that captures all the dependencies. You don't need some single massive DAG object in Python. So here we're looking at just the assets that I showed you the definitions of. We've also got links to assets that these assets depend on, um, but that are loaded by Dagster separately. So you can navigate this vast asset graph. Um, <clears throat> at this point, all that we're looking at is a set of asset definitions. So these were uh, sort of fully derived by our, uh, from our code. They don't correspond yet to artifacts in physical storage. Um, <clears throat> they have no associated materializations in Dagster speak. Dexter doesn't just track asset definitions, though. It also allows you to materialize assets, and it tracks those materializations. So we can uh, click this button on the upper right to materialize all the assets that are shown. 
That's going to launch a run, which contains a log of everything that happens as we execute the computations that materialize these assets. When the run is complete, each asset now has a materialization. That is, it now exists in persistent storage, and Dagster knows about that and when it arrived there. Dagster knows some other useful stuff as well, and if we dive into one of these assets, we can see it. So here's the page for an individual asset, our activity forecast asset. It contains details about the asset and its history of materializations. A materialization is not just a record saying that a computation ran. It's a description of the object that was produced by that computation. Dexter lets users plug in code that records arbitrary runtime metadata about the asset being materialized. So for example, we've recorded a few things about this materialization. We have the number of rows uh, in this table. We have the file system path where it's stored. We have a sample of the data, if we want to spot check it to see if something's wrong. And we have the set of columns and their data types. This asset focus view is especially valuable when you shift to the perspective of someone who depends on an asset. So let's imagine we're in our BI tool and we're using this activity forecast asset to try to understand what the future holds for our website. Maybe we notice something fishy. Uh, some of the data that we expect to be there is missing. We can pull up this search box in, box in Dagster, type in the asset we care about, and get to that asset page that we were looking at before. From that page, we have all this information about the asset, its materializations, its dependencies, its metadata, um, what we expect this asset to look like from the code perspective uh, at our fingertips. And if we have permissions, we can directly launch a run to rematerialize the asset and patch up the issue. So let's summarize what we just saw so far. Software-defined assets provide a layer above our physical storage that allows us to express what assets we expect to exist and how those assets are produced. The software-defined asset graph is based on assets that are defined in code, which means that practices for managing and evolving code can be harnessed for managing and evolving data. We can launch runs to materialize our assets, which means computing their contents and writing those contents to physical storage. By focusing our tooling on assets instead of tasks, it becomes easy to get visibility into what has happened um, with the assets that we care about. So we define some assets and materialize them, which is cool, but it's not enough. It's not enough because assets are constantly changing. So new upstream data is constantly arriving, and we're constantly changing the code that derives our assets from that upstream data. The result is that our asset materializations will naturally drift from their definitions over time. When that drift occurs, we need to launch computations to bring those materializations in line with their definitions. Launching computations at the right time is typically the job of an orchestrator. So what does an orchestrator do? Typically, orchestrators are systems that are responsible for a few things. So they invoke computations at the right time. They model the dependencies between computations um, so they can run computations in the right order and they track what computations ran. This makes them the natural experts on a few topics. Like they know when stuff is gonna happen, um, uh, they know when stuff has happened, and they know what it takes to make something happen. Because they're the experts on these topics, they hold the key to answering some of the most important questions that we end up having about our assets. For example, is this asset up to date? What do I need to run to refresh this asset? When will this asset be updated next? What code and data were used to generate this asset? And after pushing a change, what assets need to be updated? But if you try to pose these questions to a traditional orchestrator, you'll immediately run into the issue that they have no idea what an asset is. They can tell you what tasks completed, what tasks are meant to run after each other, but not how any of that has to do with the assets that these tasks are reading or writing. They're ill-equipped to answer these questions because asset is not a core part of their data model. So if we could conceive of orchestration in a way that's centered on assets, we'd have an extremely powerful set of tools for managing and understanding those assets. <laughs> 
we talked about the job of a traditional orchestrator. The job of an asset orchestrator is a little bit different, and it's to manage change in data assets. Dagster supports two approaches to orchestration for assets. The first one looks very uh, similar to how scheduling works in traditional orchestrators, except that it focuses on assets instead of tasks. So you can select a set of assets to be rematerialized at some regular cadence or via a sensor based on arbitrary logic. The second one fully leans into the declarative approach. You tell your orchestrator to launch computations that resolve discrepancies between your asset definitions and their materializations in storage. So let's cover both of these, but start with the one on the left. This code tells Dagster to run a job every day at midnight, and that job rematerializes a subset of the assets inside our graph. So in this case, it's just um, rematerializing this single activity daily stats asset, but it could uh, uh, target a set of assets. Here's what this scheduled job looks like in Dagster's UI. Up on the top here, we can see when it's going to run. Um, in this case, it's uh, daily. Um, <clears throat> And the job includes just the assets we have selected. We can still see the data lineage between the assets inside the job and assets outside the job. This makes it really easy to navigate to an upstream job and see how those assets are produced and scheduled. Putting the schedule on the asset instead of the task also makes it easy for stakeholders to answer important questions like, when will this asset be updated next? Um, so if you're looking at uh, you know, some data and you're, not familiar, you're, you're wondering why it <clears throat> seems out of date, you can go to your orchestrator and get an answer to that question. When they navigate to the page for an asset, they can see the frequency that it's expected to be updated at. So just by framing scheduling in terms of assets instead of tasks, the orchestrator becomes an ideal system for answering these questions that we looked at earlier. It eliminates the friction of translating between tasks and assets, and it can speak authoritatively about how assets are gonna be updated as time passes. And so that gets us pretty far, but fully realizing the benefits of a declarative approach requires going farther to an orchestration approach that's based on reconciliation. So here's how that works. First, we observe discrepancies between how the world is and how the world should be. Then we launch any computations that are required to make those two match. Finally, rinse and repeat. The most basic discrepancy in need of reconciliation is when you have a software-defined asset with no materializations. So there's a table that you expect to exist, but you never actually ran the code that's supposed to create it. To make the assets in physical storage match the assets you've declared, you need to materialize the asset. A related discrepancy is when you're working with a partitioned asset. Only some of its partitions have materializations. So you need to fill in those, uh, those missing partitions. A third discrepancy is when the contents of an asset don't reflect the contents of the assets that it depends on. So here, the table at the bottom depends on the two tables above it, but one of them was updated more recently than the table at the bottom. So the contents of the table at the bottom are probably stale and Dagster raises this discrepancy with a upstream changed indicator. A fourth discrepancy is when the metadata on an asset definition doesn't match the metadata from its latest materialization. So here's an asset whose definition includes metadata that describes the set of columns that it's expected to contain. Every time we, uh, re every time we materialize this asset, we record the columns that were included in the materialization. If the asset is fully reconciled, then these two lists of columns should match. But in the case up here, they don't match. The definition includes a column that the latest materialization does not. So maybe we updated our code recently to add this column, but we never actually ran our code. Um, so we need to take some action to resolve them. The reconciliation approach can be more involved and heavyweight because it requires thinking about all the different ways that an asset's materializations can stray from its definition. But it has a few big draws. Instead of trying to keep track in your head of when assets have drifted from their materializations, you delegate that bookkeeping to the orchestrator. 
you can avoid unnecessary computation. So why recompute an asset if nothing about its inputs have changed? And you can get a rationale for why computations happened. For example, we rematerialized asset X because the columns it had no longer matched the columns that we expected it to have. So at this point, I hope you have a decent understanding of the fundamentals of software-defined assets and how we manage change inside of them. With that out of the way, I'd like to talk about them in the context of what's happened in the world of data in the past couple of years. If you ask 20 people for definitions of the modern data stack, you'll get at least 20 answers, but here's a fairly bland one that I think at least isn't going to ruffle too many feathers, which is that the modern data stack is a set of tools and practices that have dramatically simplified common patterns for working with data. At least in part, I think that the modern data stack owes its success to an embrace of declarative principles. For example, in the past, if you wanted to build a derived table, you would write an Airflow task that issues a create table statement to your database. Nowadays, you're more likely to declare the table directly as a DBT model. In the past, if you wanted to ingest the table into your data warehouse from your production database, you'd write an Airflow task that executes a sync. Nowadays, you're more likely to just tell Fivetran or Airbyte or Meltano that you want that table to exist in your warehouse. With these declarative approaches, you get all the declarative benefits that we discussed earlier. So they're highly effective at taming complexity. But there's something that's lost as well. And to understand it, we need to go back in time to the pre-modern world. In the world before the modern data stack, you would use an imperative orchestrator like Airflow to invoke computations across a variety of frameworks. As we covered earlier, there are a lot of problems in this world. So having an imperative orchestration layer fosters a lot of chaos, and it forces you to constantly translate between the world of assets and the world of tasks. But there's an important baby here that we shouldn't throw out with the bathwater, uh, which is that this centralized orchestration layer makes it easy to understand everything that's running in one place, and to make sure that things are running in the right order, even across tools. In the world of the modern data stack, purpose-built tools for each of these verticals essentially roll their own orchestrator. So each of the tools shown here, except Python, which we'll get to in a minute, offers its own way to schedule a work and view the assets that are defined by it. I think this loss of a central control plane is a regression. The lack of a shared orchestration layer results in an operationally fragile data platform. When dependencies cross tool boundaries, so for example, when the dependencies that you derive via DBT, or, uh, sorry, the tables that you derive via DBT depend on tables that are synced from a production database, it becomes difficult to get a coherent view of what's going on. When dealing with this situation, a common pattern is basically to try to time the schedules so that syncs will complete before the derived tables are rebuilt. But this is pretty brittle. So if your ingestion syncs take longer than uh, you expect, there's this overlap in timing, and the derived tables will get rebuilt using stale data. It's pretty easy to lose track of what ran, what's supposed to run, and whether things ran in the right order. You might also notice that Python has been largely left behind. By focusing on specialty tools that simplify common patterns, we risk losing the ability to run generalized computation when we need it. So we're forced to choose between, on one side, uh, this unified approach that's stuck in an imperative paradigm, uh, the pre-modern data stack, or on the other side, a declarative approach without a unified control plane. I don't think there's any fundamental reason that we need this trade-off. So we can have a declarative asset-based orchestrator that supports polyglot compute. Dijkster allows delegating computation and asset definitions to external tools like DBT and Airbyte while maintaining a unified control plane over them. That unified control plane is declarative so you don't lose sight of the assets that you're working with when you schedule them with your orchestrator. And it makes Python a native citizen of the modern data stack. Python asset definitions can coexist alongside dbt models, um, uh, Airbyte, Fivetran, syncs, et cetera. Here's the Dagster asset definition graph that spans Python, dbt, and Airbyte. The three assets at the top are tables 
that are populated via uh, Airbyte ingestion syncs. When you materialize them, Dagster will uh, call out to Airbyte to run those syncs. The assets in the middle uh, with the orange tags are dbt models. So if you uh, click the button or run a schedule to materialize them, uh, Dagster will call out to dbt. And the asset with the light blue tag on the lower right is an asset that's computed using Python. It's downstream of one of these dbt models. So that brings us to the end of our journey. And let's boil it down to the main things that we talked about. The world of data needs a new spanning abstraction, the software-defined asset, which is a declaration in code of an asset that should exist. Defining assets in software enables a new way of managing data that makes it easier to trust, easier to organize, and easier to change. The seat of the asset definition is the orchestrator. The system that you use to manage change should have assets as its, assets as its primary abstraction and is in the best position to act as their source of truth. When it comes to the modern data stack, software-defined assets allow Python to become a first-class citizen. And asset-based orchestration offers a unified control plane across different tools. Uh, so that's all I've got. We would love to see you in our Slack, which you can get to from our website, dagster.io. Thank you so much. So could you talk a little bit about the Spark interface and PySpark, um, specifically where it, when you're executing one of the functions, is it running remotely or is it in the cluster? Like, are you taking advantage of a Spark uh, worker? So can you just talk a little bit about the Spark interface or capability? Definitely. So sorry, let me just zoom through these slides. Maybe I can get back to... Um... Uh, this code example over here. Um, so this is an example of an asset that's defined using Python. In this case, uh, it's accepting a pandas data frame and it's returning a pandas data frame. Um, but you can basically do this with Spark data frames as well. Um, or you could take a Spark data frame as input, uh, produce a machine learning model, et cetera. Um, you then have the option to basically run this anywhere that Spark can run. Um, so Dagster doesn't um, sort of have a monopoly on how it expects you to uh, manage compute. Uh, you can basically, you can use um, Yarn or uh, Databricks under the covers. Uh, I'm currently working with Dagster and dbt, and do you think uh, the asset definitions and things will change when dbt releases it with Python support? Good question, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, when dbt releases Python support, my understanding is that they, um, are targeting a fairly narrow uh, set of uh, Python tasks that are specifically focused on table transformations in Python. Um, I think we're gonna support that. So we can ingest dbt models. Um, we'll be able to support uh, dbt Python models as well as uh, uh, dbt SQL models. Um, but we'll also have the ability to run sort of fully general Python compute. Um, so not necessarily just operating on tables, um, and able to, for example, uh, call out to a Databricks cluster um, <clears throat> uh, and run in a sort of um, more advanced uh, underlying compute environment. Yeah. Uh, one more uh, follow-up. Uh, on the materialization part, uh, you said like it can be run like non-materialized view and on materialization. dbt by default like does a materialization config. So how do you handle that for dbt? Yeah, I mean, so in a way, our life is just a little bit easier in that case. We don't necessarily need to continually schedule updates to the software-defined assets. Um, instead, we only, um, you would only um, rematerialize it in Dagit or in Dagster in the case where your definition changes. So maybe you've pushed a change to that dbt model, um, and you need that to be reflected in your database. Fantastic. Thank you again, Sandy. That was awesome. We're unfortunately out of time, but if you guys have questions um, after this, we can definitely you know, uh, uh, pose those questions to Sandy. Thanks again. Give him a round of applause, folks. Thanks so much. <laughs>